Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So, pleasure now to welcome all the way from Berlin, Marta Quattro. Thank you very much. So, let's have a short thought experiment. We are in the so-called confessional age, so the phase of consolidation between the religious peace of Augsburg, 1555, and the peace of Westphalia, 1648. First jubilee of the Reformation, 1617. Almost everywhere, the same text for celebration and preaching was chosen, 2 Thessalonians, two Thessalonians 2, the text of the Antichrist. In a short pamphlet focusing on the topic of the end of time and its signs, printed anonymously in Heidelberg in 1608, other opponents of the Antichrist before Luther are mentioned, Wycliffe, Hus and Savonarola, drawing a line in a possible, underlying, uh, in a possible tradition underlying the negative, apocalyptic attitude combined with an eschatological expectation in the interpretation of the present time. Despite the recognition of several antichrists, the proper antichrist remained for Luther himself the papacy, and this kind of pattern of revelation has been presented even in the formula of Concord. For example, here, this is the preface. The importance of the Reformation as a historical event should be found in, in the historical revelation of the hidden pattern of the revelation as a whole. The link between heroical interpretation and Antichrist's botschaft, literally the message of the Antichrist, so the concept of the revelation of the hidden Antichrist, represents the main form of self-interpretation self of the whole Reformation, even in the collective imagination of the time. The connection with the medieval tradition made it totally understandable in the demand for the right in uh, separation from the authority of the Papal Church, and the institu institutionalization of the anti-Roman polemic became a topos of the evangelical proclamation, spreading soon in form of Flugschriften, the pamphlets, within, uh, within theologians and folks as well. The identification of the papacy with the Antichrist appeared first in 1521 in the so-called Anticatharinus as an exegesis of Daniel 8, the Antichristo. The spreading of such kind of evaluation among the evangelical theologians has been made clear by the number of signatures in, on Melanchthon's Triatis de Potestate Primatu Pape, 1537. The apocalyptic interpretation of history made the battlefield, so to say, between the true and the false church where concrete dates and persons play the role of the testes veritatis, makes the soteriological claim of the parousia so clear that the doomsday is described as liba jungstatag, literally something like mm, lovely doomsday, bringing to an end God's plan. Luther's discovery of the telogumenon of the Revelatio Antichristi has been made part of the apocalyptic revelation of the propria signa dei novissimi, representing a stark eschatological claim. The main example of the reception of this attitude is Matthias Flatus Illyricus, who, beside his masterpiece, which is quite well known, Magdeburg Centurion, in 1556 collected in the so called Catalogum Testum Veritatis 400 signs against the papacy as Antichrist. On the contrary, the theologians with a humanistic background, first and foremost Melanchthon himself, but even Zwingli and Calvin, had almost no apocalyptic claim. Of course, they agreed with Luther in understanding the papacy as Antichrist and in his interpretation of history, but remained suspicious in regard of the apocalyptic approach in the sense that the prophecy was much more understood as a chronological device. But for Luther, much more important of the computation of the end of time was the certainty that he was in the very last stage of time. He provided no information about the starting point of the presence of the Antichrist in the Church. His main interest was to present the present age at the last of the history of the Church, the age of the Antichristiani. Right after Luther's death and the renewal of conflicts against the Catholicism, the concept of the Antichrist has been linked to the particular context of the so-called Magdeburger Hegotskanzlei, literally Chancellery of the Lord. What during Luther's preaching hasn't happened yet, but happened at this stage, is that such, com such concept has been used not only in the polemic against the Catholicism, but even in infra-Protestant arguments. 
so that after this period became usual to classify the doctrine of an opponent as antichristical and, uh, anti and so to understand it as a sign of the Antichrist. Today I will focus or rather sketch some observation on this particular group. Let's take a step back, let's take a step back to the context. After the defeat of the Evangelical League, in, uh, League of Smalkald in the Smalkald War in 1547, Luther died in 1546, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V ordered at the Diet of Augsburg in 1548 some criteria for the regulation of the religious policy in the sense that he tried to unite Catholic and Protestant, in the sense that he tried to unite Catholics and Protestants in the territories of the Holy Roman Empire. The Council of Trent was moved to Bologna in 1547 and far from achieving some relevant results. A commission formed by Agricola, Plug, Helding and Billig drew up a law in the same year, the declaration of his Roman Imperial Majesty on the observance of religions within the Holy Empire until the decision of a general council as known as Augsburg Interim. It focused on the practical regulation of faith, the ceremonies and the sacramental praxis granting the Catholic standpoints for any central topics. The law was rejected both from Catholic and Evangelical side. By the Evangelical side, including Philip, including Philip Melanchthon, on the account that it didn't ensure justification by faith as fundamental doctrine. Against the interim spread a huge polemic production and the opposers, guided by Matthias Flatius Illyricus, collected themselves in the free city of Magdeburg as Magdeburga Exules. The city took the proud name of Herrgott's Kanzlei, Chancellor of the Lord. In 1549, the Duke, of, the Duke Maurice of Saxony, a controversial figure, former allied with the Emperor, whose clever manipulation of alliances and disputes brought to the Albertine branch of the Vettin dynasty extensive lands and electoral dignity, persuaded Melanchthon, the Leipziger theologian, Johannes Pfeffinger and their fellows, the so-called Albertinian theologians, that is the supporter of the Albertinian policy on religion, to accept a compromise known as Leipzig Interim. It included the doctrine of justification sola fide and in exchange stated that doctrinal differences not related to justification, uh, not related to justification by faith were adiaphora or matters of indifference. So it was actually an acceptance of the Catholic standpoints in this regard. This, together with, an orga with the organization of an armed action against the, the free city of Magdeburg, theologically justified by Pfeffinger, here for example, with assumption that Luther was a nectar adiaphorist, literally a true adiaphorist, was vehemently opposed by Matthias Flatius and the Magdeburger theologians, claiming that the adiaphora had ceased to be adiaphora in case of scandal and confession. The resistance was massive, and at the beginning of November 1550, a huge counter reaction appeared. Nicolaus Gallus wrote a Gegenbericht against what stated by Pfeffinger. Matthias Flatius wrote a sharp attack at personam, vida di neue reformation, literally against the new reformation. Even the Hamburger theologian uh, Joachim Westphal published in Magdeburg a counter reaction based on a compendium of Luther's excerpts. For Nicolaus von Hamstorff, uh, an important collaborator and friend of Luther, the topic was even more uncomfortable. He wrote that Dr. Martinus Kera Diaphoris gewesen ist, and a plenty of texts against Pfeffinger in the subsequent months. This harsh counter reaction brought actually something. Maurice of Saxony refused an active support for his political actions, action against the Magdeburger. I would really like to make one point clear. It was not a matter of theological controversies, but rather a proper political resistance. They had to face a military reaction and uh, the behavior of the Albertine theologians, who were actually still Lutheran theologians, was of course considered a treason, even, be, even more because they handled Luther's own work to justify their own compromises with the Catholicism. This is the point when we talk about Lutheran identity as controversial process. It's a matter of preserving, perhaps too stubbornly, the pure Lutheran position shortly Luther's position in the Confession of Augsburg and in his Markart articles against this mangling. The, Magdeburg, the Magdeburger wrote even a known alternative confession, this one, the Magdeburger Bekenntnis. And here this point is particularly clear. It is really a matter of resistance. The minor authority should, must, 
or is this the major one? But let me first clarify the bone of contention. In Christianity, adiaphora are matters not regarded as essential by faith, but nevertheless as permissible for Christians or allowed in church. That means that what is specifically considered adiaphora depends on the theological standpoint in view. And that is the problem. The Confession of Augsburg only states that the true unity of the church is enough to agree about the doctrine of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments. No, it is necessary that human traditions, rites or ceremonies should be everywhere alike. This, however, opens the field for several deeply diverging interpretations. In the formula of Concord, both extremes were rejected and the adiaphora have been defined as church rites that are, uh, I quote, neither commanded nor forbidden in the word of God. However, the Concord added believers should not yield even in matters of adiaphora when these are being forced <coughs> upon them by the, I quote, enemies of God's word. word. In the German Reformation, the issue of what constituted a diaphora became a major dispute, as long as it represented the necessity to state a known theological identity as resistance against a given theological political pattern. The topic of the construction of a known identity is in other terms a matter of reaction, opposition or diversification. And this reflects Luther's own attitude against the Roman Church. No wonder that the arguments show a recurring pattern. The readiness to compromise shown by the Albertinian theologians make them traitors of Luther's message, allied of the Roman Church, that is the Church of the Antichrist, and so demonical weapons struggling against the real word of God, corresponding to the Lutheran doctrine, of course. Um, following a given pattern, the legitimation of Lutheranism as historical event and revelation is made possible due to its historical defeat. Recognize a sign of the divine presence, historically re revealing itself as mortifying bond, age of martyrdom preceding the end of time. The parousia and the following, the following intensification of the topic of the wait for the end of time are related to a purification of the doctrine, or rather to the search of the pure Lutheran doctrine. In this sense, the Augsburger and the Leipziger interim fulfill the antichristical marks provided by the usual authoritative points 2 Thessalonians 2, Matthew 24, Luke 21. The Magdeburger interpretation of the interim, together with the Clausula Petri, seems to be so clear that the identification of the papacy with the antichrist needed no more proof. The interim proved it enough. The Adjafora opened the door in the Magdeburga Exodus view to the realm of the Antichrist that represented a recatalization, so a defeat for the faith. The Pope as Peter's successor and mean bishop is clearly, bishop is clearly the Antichrist, so the Roman Church is the Church of the Antichrist. Service and canon are intended as key point of the interim, laying the ground for the Antichristianity. The unnecessary mediums are evaluated as falsification of the doctrine and elements of confusion. The readiness to compromise of the so-called Adiaphoristen, the Albertinian, Leipziger and Wittenberger theologians it identified with the false prophets of the synoptic apocalypse is read as an overstep of the Christian freedom, setting the Christians under the government of the Pope Antichrist. So, what's properly Luther's heritage for the theologians of the Hergotskanzlei? An apocalyptic potential developing as proud negative sense of radical opposition to any political, uh, to any theological political foundation. First point, any political, any positive theological, uh, any positive theological political foundation is by definition antichristical. Second point, therefore any readiness to compromise to the antichristical theological political power is a sign of the same antichristical attitude or identity. Third point, so the only possible self-interpretation as Christians is a materiological one, in the sense that the historical, political and theological defeat is a Christological sign of the divine presence. The very core of this standpoint, of this standpoint is, that in this attitude should be, is that this attitude should be integrated first and foremost in the basis of Luther's theology. The way in which Luther discovered and explained his apocalyptic view of history depends essentially on of his discovery, so to say, of the real meaning of the gospel, and so with the opposition against the Roman Church. 
structurally, uh, structurally, Lutheran identity and construction of identity depend first and foremost on a negative element, on a limitation. Assuming that this attitude concerns the whole historical structure, the main apocalyptical pattern, as for Luther himself, is for the Magdeburger the book of Daniel. Daniel's prophecy applies wonderfully to this context. Written in the Hellenistic age, as Jadia has been, made, has been made a province by Alexander the Great, it criticized the Greek policy and provides a great expectation or rather hope for the future, for a liberation operated by God in an unexpected but legal way. Its pattern was fruitful in a double way, as meta-historical inspired knowledge of essential elements concerning the immediate future and consisting in a moral and religious order beside or perhaps again, the, against the political condition, conditions and its, in its revelation and transmission of imaginative visions. It is an apocalypsis in the proper literal sense of the term, a figurative outlook for serious conflicts until the future collapse of all theological, poli theological political systems on Earth, their beginning and development, being the doomsday they harvest. This attitude has, of course, its implicit theological background, and this is not that surprising pattern. Referring to the powerful visions of the Book of Daniel and identifying Luther with Daniel, and in this context, calling the Wittenberg and Leipzig theologians the false prophet of the apocalypse, shows the presence of a certain Joachimite or pseudo Joachimite influence. Um, here, for example, there's an image of Luther represented as uh, Joachim from Fjord, uh, of Fjord. By no means it is a proper element of the Reformation itself. It was spreading all over Europe and also thanks to a huge amount of Joachimite printings in Venice, for example, the Expositio Super Apocalypsim has been reprinted in Venice in 1527. In any case, Joachim of Fiore uh, became the prototype of the old man and the emblem of a given form of prophetism. And this approach deeply influenced the preaching of Luther himself and represented a crucial point for the construction of a Lutheran identity. So to sum up some, to sum up some conclusions, let's have a look on what has been stated in the section at the offer of the solid declaration of the formula concord. Yeah. In a time of persuasion, in case of confession, even to the enemies of the gospel do not come to an agreement with us in the doctrine, yet some ceremonies abrogated, which in themselves are adiaphora and either commanded or forbidden by God, may without violence to conscience be reestablished in compliance with the pressure and demand for that for adversary. And thus, in such a diaphora matters of indifference, we may indeed come to an agreement with them. But on the other, especially when, it's, when it is in the design of adversary, either through the force or compulsion or in an issue's manner to suppress the pure doctrine and gradually return to the this also a diaphora can in no way be done. It has been said without violence to conscience and prejudice to the divine truth. So, uh, this is particularly interesting because at this stage we are beyond the stage of the conflict and you have time to find a compromise between the parties. And this is known, and this text is nonetheless particularly harsh in this respect. Uh, after the proper section of the diaphora, there is another section composed by a series of excerpts of Luther's Markard articles, just to make clear how much this underlying negative apocalyptic attitude represents an essential point for the self-legitimation of the Lutheranism itself. In its consolidation at the end of the 16th century, it remains in its attitude at least, an attempt of differentiation from the historical contingencies. Its eschatological expectation remains almost the, almost the same. It was clear, for instance, in the first jubilee of the Reformation, when almost everywhere in the same, in the same text was chosen. It might be difficult to recognize these underlying flows in the official texts, but in some, it's, it might be sometimes easier if we take into consideration some radical groups or events, and that was my attempt today. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you. Questions for Marta? Are yes. Lovely. Thank you, Marta. Very interesting. My knowledge of mid 16th century Germany is quite limited, so I'm glad that you've been able to fill mm -hmm. in some of the gaps. Um, just a couple of things that you mentioned, maybe you could perhaps elaborate on. Yes. Uh, I was struck you mentioned Joachim of Fiore, for example, um, who may not be a figure familiar to everybody in the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been arguments made of a very long reception history for Joachim of Fiore. So perhaps you could 
perhaps outline to the audience who he was, what his major theory was, why he's been considered to be such an important figure okay. in the Reformation. And then my second one was that you mentioned the identification of the Pope as Antichrist mm -hmm. and what the long-term repercussions of that identification were in Protestant millenarian thought, both in Lutheran and Calvinist forms. Uh, sorry, I didn't The identification of the Pope with Antichrist, mm -hmm. what the consequences were in both Lutheran and whether there's a distinction between the Lutheran identification and a Calvinist, or whether they, they reach the same conclusions? The differences between... Uh, I start with the second question. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, well, um, I said uh, that the difference... Uh, well, that uh, the apocalyptic reception and the reception of the identification uh, of the papacy with the Antichrist is different is different in Luther, uh, well, in Luther as a stark apocalyptic claim, and it is very eschatological oriented. And I, I told that, for example, in Luther, uh, in Melanchthon, but uh, in Zwingli too, and in Calvin, this element is anyway present, but it is different as long as the it is, is uh, as long as it is not so um, apocalyptically connoted. Do you, do you think Luther pushes it further than Melanchthon, for example? Do you think? Yes, I think that Melanchthon, uh, for example, Melanchthon uh, uses massively the prophecy of Elijah. Yeah. Uh, is, is that the one with the history is divided into three phases of two thousand years? Yes. Yeah. Um, Luther sometimes quotes um, Melanchthon writings uh, about the prophecy of Elijah, but um, basically rejects it as non-biblical prophecy, and uh, it rejects uh, this, this, this use of the prophecy as a chronological device, as attempt to, to, to calculate when the end of time is coming. Uh, Luther uh, sees the prophecy of anti um, as Antichrist in the sense that this vision, this, I, I called it uh, Antichrist, not only I called it, uh, for example, Vokalepian calls it Antichrist Botschaft, in the sense of the message of the Antichrist, the, the, the revelation of the already existent but hidden Antichrist signs the turning point to the, to the end of time. It's the sign that makes the present age, the current age, uh, the, the, the very last stage of time. I think that's the main difference in this. this well, um, in this approach, I see the main, the main difference between Luther and the other reformers. Reformators, uh, reformers. Um, the question of Joachim of Fiore. Uh, Joachim of Fiore is a very well-known preacher, a very well-known medieval preacher, uh, whose, inf whose influence and whose. Interpretation of history as divided in ages, as the, the uh, uh, interpretation of history as a history of the church uh, divided in ages, had a very massive uh, reception uh, even in the modern age. Uh, it is important in the Reformation as long as it was important in the 15th and 16th century, I would say is not a proper Lutheran reception or, or it has not more to do with Luther as for, for, for example, the Catholic side. There was a massive um, Joachim at reception in the Catholic side too. Um, and it, of course, and for sure Luther uh, note uh, the Joachim at doctrine and so on, but uh, it's quite impossible to trace back the origins of this reception. For example, it might be due to the mm, Bohemian theologists, Matthew of Tarnov and so on. It might be, or it might be that he lived in Iceland in, uh, uh, in an early stage of his preaching, of his work as theologians, together with a uh, Franciscan Joachim, Joachim at preacher. It, it, mm, for several reasons, it might be that in, it might got in contact with this Joachim might background. We we cannot trace back with uh, 
with certainty how we mm, got in contact with this approach, but uh, it, it is clearly recognizable in this division of age of history. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? John? Yeah, I'll come to you. Yeah, thank you for that. You, you mentioned uh, martyr, martyrdom. Yes. Very important to Lutheran identity. So the, the Calvinists produce lots of martyrologies, you know, John Crespan and Adrian von Hamstein and John Fox. Mm -hmm. do, the, do the Lutherans produce martyrologies like that, you know, uh, stories of martyrs and major collections of martyrdom stories? Uh, well, the, 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 this kind of production, this kind of florilegia uh, collection of exemplars and so on, was uh, quite quite diffuse in the the, the whole Lutheran production. Uh, for example, mm, several uh, Melanchthon's fellows uh, wrote uh, some kind of mm, production of this type, but it was. Mm, I would say mm, much more uh, uh, a kind of entertaining literature of the time as uh, proper theological literal production. But this materiological background is very, very recognizable in the whole production of the Magdeburger and the, and the Ignacio Lutheran as well. I think that I think it's is in this case, uh, well, it's not a materiology in the proper sense of the term, but this materiological element is mm, an important aspect of the of the Lutheran identity in this particularly troubled period. I mean, they, 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 they describe they themselves as a Magdeburger exules, martyrs, uh, and so on, and it is a self-representation as martyrs. But it's, it's maybe not, I mean, in the Dutch and the French and the English case, it's almost this becomes part of national Protestant mythology, you know, mm -hmm. way almost consolidating a Protestant national identity. Whereas that's not, is that not quite the same thing in the Lutheran world? Uh, I think it is, but much more in the Melanchthon's Fellows production, as far as I know. So as literary genre. But I'm referring to this materiological attitude in the in other kind of theological and even sometimes propagandistical writings. So yes, Thanks. it is a much more uh, an attempt to, to to give advices to the folks or to give advices against these false prophets of the synoptical apocalypse who are trying to get in contact or to. Mm, to find some kind of accordance with the Catholicism and so on. So, I, in this sense, I refer to the materiological production, but of course, it's in a literary genre too, and of course, it's contributing to create a Lutheran identity too. Okay, keep it brief. I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. <laughs> um, now, um, yes. Uh, Oh, God. Um, our vicar was now gone down to take up a parish in Brighton. On one occasion, gave a sermon on gay marriages, right? It didn't sound too unreasonable the way that he put it, although I was looking out the window so it might most just of the time. A bit faster it and a bit louder. Just, just I a minute. You. It didn't sound too unreasonable the way that he put it, although I was looking out the window most of the time. Um, but um, the Bible has very strict teachings on this. Now I'd like to mention a play. Play back in the Victoria, in the Elizabethan era, you know Queen Elizabeth I, by Christopher Marlowe. He was around in Shakespeare's time, um, called Dr. Faustus. In Dr. Faustus, every one of the seven deadly sins comes on and gives his speech. Now, to the 20th century man, he appears to be 
Yeah, this is Christopher Marlowe, uh, a man of very strong morals, leading a very moral life. But the Elizabethans, fearing the sanctitude of their state, of their church, and the security of their state, he was a heretic. To me, it seems easy to think of this century as being uh, the 20th century, it's not as the 21st. To me, see, he still seems to be a very moral man, leading a very moral life, proposing and leading a very moral life. But it's a warning also not to reach too high, like the bar, like the tower, those in the Tower of Babel, and not to delve too deep, like the witches in Macbeth, in your scholastic pursuits of Christianity. I was wondering two things. What would one, what were your views on that? And two, what, where exactly do you come from? Where, where, were, you, where were you born? Uh, <laughs> see what I'm getting at. Okay, Marta, do you want to take those questions? Uh, you, can, you can tell him where you were born. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I understood it properly, but uh, I guess that this kind of apocalyptic warnings and, and mm, this kind of apocalyptic attitude has, uh, tends to follow always similar pattern, so uh, that might be for this reason that you can see similarities or... Um, might you repeat the question, please? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and so the answer to the second question is Rome, I believe, isn't it? Huh? Rome. Rome, Rome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, let's take a short break there. It's start is it raining? So we, we can dive, quick stretch of legs back in, say, 15 minutes? Okay. <laughs>